What's going on guys and welcome back to another one of my tutorial videos. Today I'm going to be going over step by step how to federate two OpenFire chat servers. Alright, before we get started, I do want to point out that there are resources and tutorials and information available at the IgniteRealTime.org site. Uh, if you have any questions or if there's anything that I don't cover or you're having a problem that I didn't encounter, uh, head over to this website and you should be able to get at least pointed in the right direction. Before we get started, we do need to have two OpenFire servers built. So as you can see, I do have an OpenFire server uh, running in Docker Desktop on my uh, computer here. And I also have an OpenFire server running on my QNAP NAS inside of a container as well. Uh, both of these are completely fresh, brand new containers that have not been initially configured. I'm going to run through that real fast and then we will get started. All right, now that the initial setup is done on both of my containers, I have an OpenFire server named Server1 open in uh, this tab, and an open fire server called server2 open in the second tab. No other configuration has been done whatsoever on these two open fire servers. Uh, the first thing I'm going to want to do is go into TLS certificates, and you can see there's three links we have here. There's the identity store. This is where the certificate for the local open fire server is hosted or is located. Uh, you have a trust store for connections from other servers. Any certificate that is inside this trust store will automatically be trusted for a connection to your OpenFire server. And we'll dive into that in just a second. And then the trust store used for connections from clients. This would be the XMPP client of your choice. First thing we're going to do is go look at our certificate. And as you can see, we have a certificate here that is a self-signed certificate. In an enterprise environment or a more professional environment, you would have a certificate authority. Um, you could generate a CSR or a certificate signing request by clicking on this link and then put that into your certificate authority to get an actual certificate. Uh, we're going to go ahead and just roll with the self-signed certificates in this example. We're going to go back to certificate stores and look at the trust store used for connections from other servers. Now you'll see that this is a very very long list and there's a whole lot of certificate authorities that are trusted by default. Um, a lot of them are certificate authorities from other countries, including, um, I think there's some in there from China, yep, Hong Kong Post. Uh, there, there's a whole bunch of certificate certificates in here that I don't necessarily want to trust. So the first thing I'm going to do, and it is a little bit time intensive, is I'm going to go through and remove all of these certificates. Five minutes later. Okay, now that all of those are gone, I'm going to jump to my second server and do the same thing in that trust store. Five minutes later. Okay, now that we have all of the certificates removed from the trust store on uh, both of our servers, we are going to go over to Sessions, go to Tools, and do a connection test. Here you can type the XMPP domain name that you want to attempt to make a server-to-server -server connection to. And because I'm on server one, I'm going to type in server two. When I do this test, you'll see that the remote server is not found. Uh, OpenFire does require DNS to be functioning uh, so that it can look up records that are necessary for it to find services that may be hosted on another OpenFire server. So I'm going to jump over to my pie hole, which is what I use for my local DNS. The first thing I'm going to do is create a DNS record for each of my OpenFire containers. Okay, now that those records are in there, if I come back to this page and do the test again, now it's saying that we have a certificate issue. So it was able to find the server, even though it says remote server not found. 
if you go down to the log information, it shows that it does in fact see server two, but that it was unable to negotiate TLS with the server, which is the behavior that we want. In order to fix that problem, we're gonna to have to go back to our TLS certificates, and I'm gonna examine the certificate that's on server one. I scroll down here, we do have the PEM representation of the certificate, and what we're gonna to wanna to do is copy all of that. We're gonna go into server two and go into the trust store. Again, this is the list of certificate authorities or, certi or certificates that are trusted by this open fire server for a connection. And we are going to import the certificate from server one. And we'll give it an alias of server one. Now, server two here trusts the connection to server one. We're also going to have to go into the identity store, pull the PEM representation from server two, and trust it also on server one. Now that our OpenFire servers trust each other's certificates, we're going to go attempt a connection again. From server one, we are going to attempt a connection to server two. And when I scroll down here, you can see that that still failed. We're going to have to go back to server, to where our certificates are located, and make sure that yeah, see here it says certificates were modified, so HTTP server needs to be restarted. We're going to go ahead and do that on both containers. And that will require us to log back in. Okay, so now that both of these are logged back in, we're going to go back and do a server-to-server -server connection test. We're on server two, so we're going to attempt to connect to server one. Okay, it says unable to authenticate or create a new session. Uh, we're going to try it also from server one going towards server two. So when we run this test now, we're not getting a certificate error, but it is saying it is unable to connect to any remote hosts. Um, what's actually happening in the background when it's trying to make this connection is it's doing a number of DNS queries, and we are missing some records. OpenFire re relies on service records in DNS in order to identify what services are available on each OpenFire server. So what I've done is I've compiled a list of all of the service records that are necessary for OpenFire to function, and I've put them into a single file. I'm going to show you this file real quick so you can see what is necessary. So it's a little bit of a, a long list of service records, but these are all of the possible records that XMPP will use for, for various services. Um, we are not actually required to have all of these for this particular demonstration, but I went ahead and created all of the service records in case those ever become necessary in the future, we'll have them set up. I also want to show you the host records that we created previously inside of the pie hole, and that is this list right here. As you can see, we have an A record or a host record for server one and server two, as well as the fully qualified record for server one and server two did another test, and as you can see, it was provided by the certificate from the other server, and it says that it has an authenticated secured, secured session. We go to active sessions and go to server sessions. We can see that we have a two-way session from server two to server one. If we click on it, it will show us the details about how that connection was established. Now, I'm gonna go in here real quick and create a user on server two. I'm just going to use my name, create myself a regular user, 
I'm going to do that on both sides, server 1 and server 2. Although, I'm going to make it a little bit different just so that you can see that it's it's different. On server 1, I'm going to make it kalem.add. Alright, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into group chat. I'm going to create a couple of rooms. It really doesn't like that I used a password. <laughs> I use kind of a simple password just for, for the example there. I'm going to create this room ID. It's going to be server one chat. Go ahead and create that. I'm going to go to server two, create a new room there. Call this one server two chat. And then we're going to fire up our chat client and give it a test. I'm going to log in. As you can see, I'm logged in to server one with my username Calum.cassette, I'm a regular user. I'm going to click on conferences, and here you can see conference.server1. This is a directory that will show you all of the chat rooms that are available on server one. Now, right now, I can only see the chat rooms on server one. Uh, and this is where the federation piece comes in. I'm going to type in the conference service for server 2. It's going to search for the service records in the background and the host records for server 2. And then it should populate the directory service with the conference service for server 2 like it just did. Now when I double click on server 2, it's going to query all of the rooms that exist on server 2 and list them for me. And there we go. Now we can see the chat rooms available on server two. So I can join the chat room on server two. I can also go to the chat room on server one and uh, join that. So I'm now authenticated to server one, but I'm able to join chat rooms on server two. And that's pretty much Federation in a nutshell. It is important to note that Federation is not transitive. So if you have server A and server B federated with each other, a user logged in to server A would be able to see the rooms from server A and from server B. If, however, you had a third server, let's call it server C, and it was federated with server B, you would not be able to see the rooms from server C if you were authenticated to server A. Anybody authenticated to server B would be able to see rooms from both server A and server C. So it is not transitive federation. If you want to be able to see rooms from another server, a direct federation partnership is going to have to be established using the method that I just demonstrated. I do want to take a moment to say thank you for watching. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe so you never miss out on future content. If you have any ideas or requests for content on other technologies or other systems that you'd like me to cover, please drop a comment down below and I'd be more than happy to do a tutorial just for you. Thank you and God bless.